I really do feel like the sort of time having written the tracks or kind of got them to a point where they're kind of semi-finished and then just leaving them for a while, coming back, making changes, stripping stuff out, and then again, waiting again, just to really see, right, do I actually like this piece or not? I definitely had that mindset. I, I used to finish tracks, send a bunch of stuff out straight away. But I, I do feel like looking back, I regret some of it and I regret some of the tracks that I put out and I wish I'd have waited a bit longer with them sometimes. Hey, I'm Graham Farmer, founder of the Dance Music Magazine, Data Transmission and Twitch partner streaming on Mondays, Wednesdays and Fridays from 1pm. On this channel, we share the full interviews from my Twitch streams. But before we jump into this interview, if you can help this video get more reach by giving it a like and a comment, It'd be most appreciative. And don't forget to consider subscribing so you always get notified when we drop new interviews. Reset Robot, Dave Robertson. Hey, welcome to my Switch stream. How are you doing, dude? I'm very well, mate. Thank you for having me. How are you? How, how was your bank holiday? How was your weekend? Because it's Easter, wasn't it? Uh, yeah, yeah, it's been nice, actually. Pretty chilled um, down here in Portsmouth. I didn't get up to too much. Some, you know, we've got a lovely beach down here, so I've just been kind of like hanging out down there. Um, got some great bars and sort of nice independent spots around. So just hit a few of those and yeah, hung out with the kids and stuff. So it was good. Nice. Yeah. Did yeah. you have the nice weather? You had the nice weather then as we, well? We, we have had fantastic weather and it still is here. Um, we always start these streams with a bit of fun. Um, we are, as it's lunchtime, we, I don't even know when this started in the last 12 months, but we started talking about meal deals and we <laughs> kind of, you know, you know, you know, you know, the kind of Tesco, Sainsbury's, like. I do, I do. What is your, what is your go-to if you had to go and buy a meal deal? Oh. Uh, well, I'm, I'm vegetarian, so okay, it's I am limited with what I can get, but um, I've been doing a kind of renovation project recently, and I been kind of helping out some of the guys that have been here so there have been a lot of meal deals getting <laughs> getting bought you know just around the shop at the corner um, so it. i what was i getting tesco express i was getting the falafel wrap yes packet of salt and vinegar squares nice with the squares nice yeah, squares yeah that's and old then, school yeah, I know, but you can't. You don't see them very often. So when I see when I see those around, I'm yeah. all over it. I love squares. Um, and then yeah, either a just a regular Coca Cola or a water. So that would be it for me. If I have to go to the co-op, they do this onion bargee sandwich, which is nice. which isn't oh. bad actually. I mean, you know, you're never going to get blown away by any of those things, but they, the meal deal definitely does the job. I think. This is it. This is it. This is why we yeah. kind of we've had so many great ones over the last twelve months. It's uh, my mine started off always the I like I I used to go full on the triple sandwich, the breakfast set like, and then and then like <laughs> full on the white bread triple breakfast sandwich. Now yeah. I'm like salad, salad, some water and some pineapple, and I've got a lot healthier over the last twelve so, months. Okay, well that's you know got to go with whatever your your kind of feeling. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> I think the uh, the triple the breakfast triple sandwich sounds much more appealing though. You know it. It's, it's, yeah. I always go there and I'm like, it's on the thickest of white bread as well, and you're just like, yeah. Oh I no, want it. I want it. I want it. You always sort of lean towards that stuff, don't you? Like you kind of like think I definitely should have the salad, but all of these sandwiches look much better. <laughs> yeah, you yeah. know it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's hard. Yes. Um, <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, I agree with you. How, what's been happening the last couple of years? How has it been? Like, I literally was thinking, I was just before the stream, like, this time two years ago, we had that nice, really sunny weather, didn't we? And it was like kind of going into lockdown and it was really sunny. Then last year it was, was not a bit grim. It wasn't so nice last year. That first lockdown was one of the best, I think, yeah. It was a, obviously it was a weird time, but I had a, you know, luckily I had a really good time with our, you know, with the kids and we were just at home eating so well and just laying out <laughs> in the sun. 
and and you know probably not as much studio action as I'd have wanted. You know, obviously, but it was actually looking back at it, pretty rare to get that kind of opportunity to spend lot time like that with your family. You know, yeah, like I, the first bit when we were having to homeschool, it was so stressful, and then and then the kind of sun was out, and the pool came, the paddling pool came out, and then and then. Yeah, it was, it was actually not so bad. Like I think we tried the homeschooling thing on that first one because they were, the schools weren't being as pushy with it. So we yeah. tried it, and then after about three days, we were just like, no, not not doing that. <laughs> kind of just, you know, get like you said, get the paddling pool out, get the games out, and just kind of cracked <laughs> on. On the, on the second one or third one, when the schools were being like, no, you have to homeschool the kids now. That was tough. Yeah. That yeah. was really tough. My daughter didn't want to join the Zoom. She just didn't want to know. Like, no. Except, no. except the Zoom. Except the Zoom when they had a school disco, and then I and I set the Zoom up so she was in the, in here in the disco shed. Yeah, uh, then it was and, okay. <laughs> and then she was like, "Yeah, I want to do that." And like, all her, she's dialing in, and all her mates are going. And they're all going, "Where? Are, where are you?" And then she's like, "I'm in the garden in my in, in Daddy's studio." And, and then, yeah, now that's now the talk of all of our, all of our school discos. Yeah, well, I don't, like I said, I love the decor. It looks great. <laughs> um, and then music-wise, how's the release? Like you released, I was kind of having to scroll back through releases for the last couple of years and kind of seeing what's been going on. And you've kind of been a lot more sporadic. And I, did I read you've been, you've been sitting on tracks longer? I've been sitting on tracks much longer, yeah. And I think it's been better for me personally with how I'm feeling about my music once it's been released yep. because I really know that I'm still kind of into that stuff but it does mean that there are can be sort of significant gaps in between releases I mean I think just before the album that I just did on Whistleblower my last release was on True was the I Wish You'd Never on True Soul and that was ages ago yeah um or felt like ages ago anyway it was probably like eight months or something but you know that's still quite a long time in with regards to releasing music that's ages isn't it yeah because con- now constantly it's like every you know people are releasing stuff every two weeks <sighs> that's just which is too close i think but yeah I, I really do feel like the sort of time having written the tracks or kind of got them to a point where they're kind of semi-finished and then just leaving them for a while, coming back, making changes, stripping stuff out, and then again, waiting again, just to really see, right, well, do I actually like this piece or not? That's interesting. Yeah, because I know that the, so many, you say you speak to so many people and they're like, young, obviously you newer producers, but it's like, finished it, want it signed now, yeah. let's get it out. Like, that's obviously... I, and I, I had that. I definitely had that mindset. I, I used to finish tracks, send a bunch of stuff out straight away. Mm. And But I, I do feel like looking back, I regret some of it and I regret some of the tracks that I put out and I wish I'd have waited a bit longer with them sometimes. And now and the, now you're releasing, obviously this one's on Poker Flat, but your lot of, the previous release has been on your own label. Has that yeah. kind of been a, a plan to build that up over the... Over the last couple of years? I think it's just given me a little bit more, um, I wouldn't, I don't know, freedom, because obviously you can write whatever you want anyway, but it just feels like, you know, not not everyone's going to be into everything you're doing. And it can be quite hard sometimes trying to work out what labels to send stuff to. And, you know, maybe you've got a bunch of tracks that you don't really think are going to fit on the usual ones you're releasing on. So it's mm-hmm. just a good... Pl- place for me to have not to necessarily put my more experimental stuff but just be a bit more kind of like right i've got a techno track i've got a break track i've got a kind of more housey one and i could just put them out yeah that's cool should we start with some music i was I say like i said i was gonna i want to definitely talk about the poker flat but i was listening back and i found i, I really want to play one of your tracks like i okay. really like like I was going back through it and I, this morning and going and I like through the last couple of years worth of music and I was like to see where you where you where what, you were going. What have you, what have you found? What have you found? Oh my! Oh my days! I absolutely love this track. Where is it? It's uh, Journey to a Star. Oh my Journey days! Journey to a Star. Okay. Oh my days! I love this record. So I want to start if it's okay with this one because I really enjoyed it. <laughs> First okay. and foremost. Okay. Okay. <laughs> if that's cool. 
Um, yeah, then go we'll for go, it. We'll, we'll go into the poker flat in a bit. Like, okay. Yeah, I just I just wanted the gang to hear it. I really I was I was sitting there and I was like clicking through and I'm like, this is rocking. I mean, this is well good. Let's it's a little this. bit more melodic that one, isn't it? So. Yeah. What was the vo- like? Obviously, it's a, a while back, but um, should we play it? Yeah, yeah, play it by all means, yeah. We go I'll just play a little bit of that um that's oh, let's, give it oh. <laughs> let's give it that the Thank rave you. on that's I love that yeah like I said I was just like I said I was listening through and um absolutely loved it it's interesting what you know do how different people kind of obviously connect with certain things but I think the other track on that release probably got more traction than that no one no way and, yeah, yeah, yeah. But I mean, oh, yeah, I, 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 I'm really, really sort of proud of that track. The surround sound has absolutely loving it. Nice. Thanks, dude. So the new EP is, well, let's talk about this. The new EP is out. It's a lot more like, obviously, I, whenever I think of your music, it's more thumping, driving. This is a bit more kind of down tempo, chilled, but still really cool. Yeah. Yeah, I think it's probably a bit of a, it's not necessarily a change in style because actually I, you know, some of these dra- tracks I, I did a while back. So, but I think um, often, you know, you're going to hear me releasing kind of more club heavy stuff, but I'm always writing this kind of music as well because you can't just write that same kind of vibe all the time. Yeah. But I, I think waiting for the right moment and the right person that's or a label that's going to be into those tracks is really important. And, yep. you know, when Steve messaged me, I, I probably, you know, had in mind a bunch of stuff that I could send to him and these tracks were in there and, and, and luckily enough, he was into them, but yeah, just kind of holding on to stuff and waiting for the right moment. I really do feel like it and it paid off with this for sure. And I read that you that, that you you bought a new piece of hardware for this, or you acquired a new piece of hardware for this for this EP. Yeah, I mean, not it wasn't you know I I just got a new synth, the Moog Matriarch, and um, yeah, that the main track on the EP, Tired Voice, kind of was born out of one of the first sessions that I had using that synthesizer. It's kind of a semi modular thing you can nice. plug all the cables into the front and patch things differently and um yeah it's, it is incredible and it sounds awesome but i think for this track i was kind of just using it in its basic form but i'd written a bass line on um the four in reason but it just wasn't sounding beefy enough and or i just sent the midi notes out to the matriarch and that straight away it was just sounded <laughs> huge so yeah I was I was pretty tough, and then just with the melody, kind of went an octave up. So I used I used it for a few different sounds in the track. That's cool. You still in you're in Re- you use Reason. Yeah, I, bet that's I still cool. use Reason. Yeah, that's cool. I love Reason. I I used to make yeah. music a long long. I used to I used to, to work, work at Terminals Nightclub, and I used to make sit on the train and play with Reason. I loved Reason. It's so I cool. think um, people. This is what I normally hear is people kind of go, oh, wow, yeah, you use, I used to use that when I first started. and But it's come a long way. It's so, so good. They've kind of added everything that anyone ever thought was missing from it. And it's just 
it's incredible now. I love it. And that plugs easy into your hardware when you're, when you're like I say, when you're using, is your setup at hardware and stuff? I, I have a nice kind of, you know, I've got a couple of drum machines, a bunch of synths. They're all wired in and um, everything's kind of synced with the um, ERM multi-clock, which runs from an audio, you send an audio output into it and then it just keeps everything in time, all the drum machines in time. And so everything's good to go. I, I, you know, when I got my hardware and started adding that into my setup, I wanted to be able to just kind of turn any piece on at any time and it'd be good to go. And then what's the kind of process? How do you, when you start a track, where do you, what's the, where do you start? Um, probably, you know, usually just with the, with drums. I mean, what I normally do, I don't know if you remember when you're using Reason, um, they've got a drum machine in, in there called the Redrum. Yeah, um, is it still in there? Jesus. Like the, yeah, like I, when I said this, when I said I use Reason, I'm like, oh, you must have used it in 2000. When I go, we've got Trains Terminals. Trains Terminals was like 2004. It was a long yeah. time ago. Yeah, so that was probably like reason one six. or two. Reason five. six you were on, were you? Five? Is it? Um... Could be five. It could be. I mean, I was going to say I thought it would be like 2.5 or three, but... Could be I three. I mean, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's... Long time ago, anyway. <laughs> yeah. I'd like yeah. to... They did set a challenge recently to go back and limit yourselves to limit yourself to the, um, the items that were first available in in reason one and that yeah, was yeah. quite a cool thing to do yeah that is cool yeah but anyway so um redrum so yeah you, it's a great well it's a drum machine and the, it's just so easy to program drums you know you're not kind of like drawing dots you're actually putting in patterns and then you select the next drum you put in the pattern for that it's like a 909 kind of um emulation i suppose but anyway what i like to do is get kind of basic drum pattern going but then i chuck a load of random samples into the drum machine as well because mm -hmm. you can change all the start points and pitch of everything and like i'll just sometimes put like a bass loop or like a musical more musical loops but into the drum machine put a pattern in and then just change the start point or pitch until something pops up and that's kind of you know you can get some really interesting rhythms but also really interesting sort of um, sounds from that just by using probably samples in a drum, sounds in a drum machine that aren't necessarily supposed to be used in there. So that's generally how I start, um, you know, or I could send a few MIDI notes out to a, a synth. The good thing about this reason now is they've got all these kind of players and stuff like that. So you can, there's a thing in there called the quad note generator. Um, and it's kind of just like a generative thing. You can have it locked to a certain pattern or you can kind of tell it to change, you know, have it on a 100% pitch change, a 100% note um, length variation. So every single note, that you can go crazy with it. So it gives it, you know, you can get some really interesting stuff with that, especially if you send it to one of the hardware synths. That's cool. That's really yeah, cool. they've got some great stuff. And then you can add, you can stack these players. So you can have a That's this quad note generator and then you can put a scales and chords thing with it so it keeps everything in a certain scale. And, it, you know, it, they've really kind of pushed the pushed the boat with that stuff. Yeah, there's, I think that's something, because I, I, like you're saying, with it, I remember I was using the read drum and I, it was the, the fact that it was just like, right, program that, that's easy. I know how to do that. Because I, yeah. I was really basic back then, probably still am these days, but... It was just like literally punch it in and I had drums going straight away. And I was like, this is cool. Like, let's yeah. go for it, you know? Yeah. I think that drum program was probably better than most other ones <laughs> out there, to be honest. And it's been around for about 25 years or something. Um, did I see you saying about staying with – I saw – Did I, I was reading an interview and you were saying about stay with the – stay with the thing that you're – if you're the thing you're using, if it's if it's working for you, don't don't you don't need to move. I guess that. Yeah, of... I mean, I think people. I hear a lot of talk. You know, oh, I need this. I need that bit of kit, or I need this bit of kit. But actually, you know, you can write amazing tracks with the most basic setup. Um, and if you've got a formula that, that works at, on a simple setup, I'm not saying that not people shouldn't expand what they're doing because obviously that can be really fruitful as well. I just kind of mean, 
that it's not the be all and end all having all this equipment and gear all the time it doesn't necessarily make things happen that's cool yeah i've seen people going about the new reason rack and and how good it is mr coins uk says cool it is good it is really good it's um that i think those guys gentlemen's club they use reason as well they've just they've just been made reason ambassadors nice so, yeah yeah so i want to be a reason ambassador <laughs> <laughs> let's make it happen yeah the stuff thing <laughs> Yeah, that was one of the things I, because one of the things I did work with the racks, then you kind of connect one thing into the next. And I was like, this is cool. I can change the sound. And yeah, man, that's good. You can still do all that. You know, you can flip it around. They've got all the CV cables. So you can have. That's it. Yeah. So you can, you can have your drum machine hooked up to, you know, 10 um, subtractor synths in reason. And the pattern that you put in will play each one of those synths. And, you know, you can go wild with it. That's one of the things I used to... This is mad. I used to, I used to love Reason. Wow. Yeah. Right, should we listen to this record? This is called Tired, Run, Tired Voice. Let's do it. This is the first track off the EP, Tired Voice. Let's go for this. so cool so deep thanks Thank big you. sound as well did you so do you master it after you or do you send it away to master afterwards or um, this else? one uh yeah the guys at poker flat had this mastered i mean i it was slight it was slightly better than my um master and obviously that's what you want someone else that can do it better so yeah i was happy with those, these masters actually it's it's quite uh it's often it either really shows up the mistakes in a track uh, or it comes back and, you know, they've accentuated parts and it, it, it really brings it to life. So this was one of those ones where they kind of nailed it, you know. Planity says, do you use the Sub 37 as well? Yes, I do use the Sub 37. I think on that track, there's a kind of little up running through in places and that is from the um, Sub 37. That's cool. And what were you saying about the yeah. little vocal as well, the little... So there's like that sort of in the breakdown there, every two bars, there's a kind of, it's not a vocal, it's a loop, but it kind of sounds like a vocal and then it's got a big hit straight after it. That's one of those moments where I kind of, I think it's like a, something out of one of the raw loops packs and just change the start point until, um, yeah, I kind of got this little rhythmic thing going on and yeah, that, that for me kind of in that breakdown and then coming in afterwards, really pushes the track to the, you know, adds that little bit extra that I wanted. That's cool. Yeah. Um, well, let's, yeah. So that was the first track. Let's talk about the next, let's carry on. Let's, um, the next track is, how do we say that word? Me, 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 me. Is that, is that what you go? Okay. Yeah, yeah. That is just a complete random, like, working title, but I sent it over and, and then I just thought, well, I'm just going to keep it. <laughs> yeah. How do you pick your titles? Because, I used to have, I used to, well, I haven't been reading much recently, but when I, I, when I was touring more, I used to read a lot and I would find so many cool titles in books. Um, so I'd just kind of write little bits down and I ended up with, you know, a notepad full of titles. So I just kind of rinsed that for quite a long time. But yeah, I've probably still got a bunch of those left that I could use actually. But um, yeah, I, I used to, feel like my titles are a bit more interesting. Uh, question in the chat. Are you in the box or love to be surrounded by hardware like 
pick your poison sort of thing every time you head into the studio? Bit of both. Bit of both. I think, you know, I would be happy to write tracks in the box if I was, you know, if nothing else was working or if I started something and it, and it was all sounding fine, then mm-hmm. I'd just, you know, keep it as is. But yeah, I think for me now, I'm, I'm fine with kind of integrating a few nice bits of hardware and um, the box as well. So, Do you mix masters to any specific LUFS level? No, no. I, I mean, I, I, I don't even. I, yeah, thank you for putting me on the spot here. I normally um, have my kick at around minus ten dB, yeah, and then kind of mix everything around that. So you end up with a lot of headroom on the master channel. I used to mix a lot louder, but I think it. I used to probably come into more problems. Um, especially if you've got some kind of larger sounds that you want to push in the mix, you need to have that room to be able to do that. One thing I always gets asked in our, in our questions in the chat is drum bus. I know, I know yeah. I've read in another interview, you, you speak a lot about it. So can we hear your thoughts on how you manage that? Yeah. I mean, again, it's something I never used to worry about and released so many records and, you know, um, Probably that journey to a star one. I, I imagine that I probably didn't have anything on the on the drum bus. It's not something I used to be bothered too much about. But now, yeah, it's probably something I'd do more all the time. But anything I'm putting on there, um, most of the time is going to be quite subtle. But I've been new, on a few tracks. I did a track called Play, which I released on uh, Whistleblower, and I just put this um, UAD raw distortion over the whole drum bus and it just sounded so good. Um, so I just kind of left it with this really gnarly distortion across the whole drums. Mm-hmm. And that's great. It's all just about, you know, playing and seeing what works. Everyone knows kind of what stuff should be on there, but there are no, you know, definitely are no rules. So just try things out. I normally have um, my, my drums and then a saturation compression, limiter, all the usual things. But I've tried a bit with kind of um, parallel compression as well and then parallel distortion, so completely dry signal, really compressed signal coming being mixed in quite low underneath and then a really distorted signal being mixed in underneath. And then, again, group all of those channels and then finally compress and limit that as well. So just try out different ways of doing things, basically. That's cool. That's really cool. Yeah. Just to learn, I guess. Um, so let's chat. So Meek, tell us about Meek. Yeah, so I think actually, and I, I probably um, spoke about this before in a, in a recent interview, like this one I probably had in mind for an alias I was going to start up. But I think since I sort of took my foot off the gas with regards to touring, I kind of didn't feel the need to start up another alias. Mm-hmm. Um because there would be sort of no expectations with regards to DJing, if you know what I mean. Mm -hmm. So I'm kind of hoping that I can, you know, make my reset robot alias just, you know, electronic dance music, but, you know, techno stuff, maybe some electronica kind of things, some deeper stuff like this as well. But yeah, Meeg was probably one of those ones that was heading towards being under an alias, but... Yeah, I'm I'm more than happy to do it under Reset Robot and especially on Poker Flat as well. And I think it's perfect fit as well. Yeah, the EP kind of you've got obviously the last track Jinx is a bit more tougher than you, it's kind of like yeah, a that's quite that's, that's three, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. And this one, um, me, I there were a few VSTs that I got the Arturia ones, and there's a one in there called Sem, I think. And that sounds great. And a few of these sounds are from that. And I actually made the kick drum on this on the Sub 37, which is why it's got a kind of, you know, you can kind of hear the kick almost changes every time. Um, It's got a slightly different tone to it, but it really kind of, it sort of fills that low end. Just listen. Just give it a listen. I'm excited. I really want to talk to you about Alias as well, a little bit later as well. Okay. Um, Because I'm... I'd love to hear your thoughts on it. But let's listen to this. This is Meek.
There we go. That was lovely. Euro, Euro, how's you say Euro sick? Loving the dreamy pad in the back there. Yeah, that's that. Those kind of pads are where I, I had. Um, I was just mucking about with the sub thirty-seven with the kick, and then I loaded up a couple of those VSTs and found some pad sounds. I really wanted to create some something quite atmospheric with the pads and for the drums just to be a bit looser, kind of more laid back sort of feel, I suppose. And I, I'm hoping that I sort of got to that. Point. yeah definitely um and then that obviously contrast the first track was again deep but you got more laid back on that one and then obviously the third track we're going is, is a lot more tough, a like. little bit tougher yeah yeah do you feel you need to do that when you when, when you're doing it when, when you're creating an ep do you feel you need to kind of have an expand just a wide variety of the music well i think you know like this obviously these tracks were never necessarily written to be together but i think it's interesting that steve chose these ones but Actually, they do they do really work together, and I'm pleased that he took Jinx actually because that one I've played out so many times, and it always sounded really good in a club. It's got quite a nice warm kind of feel to it, and um, always worked on the dance floor. So I'm pleased that he took that, and hopefully, yeah, that's that will kind of do its thing in in clubs. Hopefully, did you did he hit you? So you he he hit you up for music? He messaged me. And sort of said, oh, you know, I don't, he said, I don't think he hadn't been in touch. I did a remix for him on on Hot Since 82's label. Mm-hmm. And he just messaged saying, oh, I don't think I ever got in touch and said, thanks for that. And then just sort of said, if you've got anything, you know, send it over. And he said he'd like to do a release. And I sent him a bunch of stuff. I sent him a, a load of tracks that I was about to release on Whistleblower. Mm-hmm. And he actually wanted to release a couple of those. And... <laughs> I had to sort of decide because I'd already had all the artwork done. I knew what I was kind of doing. He wanted only light escapes, I think, off of my latest album. And I had to kind of say, can't do that, but I've got these other ones as well. And luckily he was he was into some of the other ones. That's cool. It just <laughs> shows though, you, you know, you don't ever know. You don't know what people are going to be into. And... Yeah, it's just worth, you know, I, I didn't think he'd necessarily take Jinx, but I sent a bunch of stuff that was unsigned that I was still really liking. Mm. And yeah, he kind of went for that one. That's mad, isn't it? Like all these new producers in the chat are just trying to send out music and trying to hit up labels. And you literally, sometimes you literally don't have a clue what they what might get signed and what might not get signed because... Exactly. And normally it's the thing that you least expect. You know, you yeah. might have an idea that you've got this big track, you send that one and nobody wants it. And then the sort of one that took you, I don't know, two or three hours to write that you're not too bothered about is the one that people end up wanting to take. Tell us about Jinx. Where's this name from? Tell us about the track. How's it come about? The drums from this are on the Electron machine drum, which is incredible. And actually recently massively gone up in price i think i picked mine up for about 450 quid mm-hmm. and i think they're up to about 80 you know 1800 quid now or something like that to get one get hold of a decent one um so i'm pleased i, I picked that up and actually it is i think that's their best drum machine the machine drum so yeah that was kind of inspired from that it's got a very particular sound to it but you can really get in and mangle the drum sounds up so you can kind of go from having a snare sound all of a sudden it's kind of sounding like a bass line you can really get in there and change things you know is that plug in again sorry just to be i know it's a piece of hardware it's a piece of hardware so yeah and i did this it's quite a while ago i did this track so it's difficult for me to kind of recall what the the inspiration was but i think like listening back to it it's the drums we're definitely on the machine drum. And then the synth work is all um, the Thor synth in Reason, um, which I love as well. Let's um, let's play this then. I'm well, uh, let's get thumping. Yeah. <laughs>
Wow. Let's give that a... Let's give that a rave man. That's sick. Love that. Cheers, man. That's thumping. Yeah, that kind of... Um, the kick and bass, the depth... Uh, of the bait, that sort of boom, 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 boom. That's from the machine drum as well. And that I played that at fabric in room two, and that low end just kicked ass on that system. I bet, I bet it sounded yeah. good in here, man. <laughs> yeah, Euro Sex going to go and buy that tune right now. Go and buy it. Yeah, go, go, go and buy, buy it. it. Go and pre-order it now. Yeah, lots of lots of people loving that track in the chat. Hands down, amazing. Stand that tune the EP. They're into the thump thump. That's great. Um, one thing. That, when we do our feedback sessions that people always struggle with is arrangements. How do you, have you got any tips for those that are making tracks in the chat? Where do you, how do you plan yours? How do you kind of, what do you think about when you're trying to arrange tracks? It really depends what, what kind of track I'm doing. I mean, like the tired voice um, track, you know, that's obviously much harder to arrange than the track we just listened to Jinx. Mm -hmm. um, Jinx, I think I probably just recorded the drums live. I probably um, played the drums and did the synths, probably doing a lot of the automation live. And then I would have done a final record of the drums and kind of, you know, brought those in and out live as well. So I think it really depends on the kind of track, but yeah, tired voice, there would have definitely been a little bit more thought going into that. And actually just before I sent the track to Steve, I went back and I the ARP was in there quite a bit and I took that out in sections just because it was getting on my nerves a little bit. So I think, yeah, if you're struggling with arrangement, what I often like to do is I don't like to dwell on it for too long. So I make decisions quite quickly and, and kind of thrash out an ar arrangement quite quickly, but then keep coming back and sort of, you know, picking holes in it, taking bits out, you know, is that sound getting annoying? let's remove it for a section or, you know, and often I'm definitely one for less is more. And if I'm kind of feeling like a song is dragging a little bit, I would remove sounds at certain points rather than trying to add lots more. Um, that makes sense. You know, even small things like, you know, taking out a clap for eight bars or a hi-hat out for eight bars can really just kind of prick up the ears a little bit. Just small, small, tiny adjustments can, can make a lot of difference. But it's where a lot of people really struggle is with arrangement. You know, so many people come to me and they're kind of like stuck in this 16-bar loop mm -hmm. and they've got a great track, but it's, it is hard sometimes to get it. You know, what you're kind of listening to constantly is everything together, which is like this, like, you know, epic moment, but kind of building up to that point can be really hard sometimes. Grady Mark, can you what's what's his tips for writer's block? Um, writer's block. I would. I haven't had it for ages, so I'm pleased <laughs> about that. <laughs> I haven't had it for ages, but I think trying something different and you know sampling things is really good. It can be really helpful. I find you know even old tracks, new tracks, whatever, but kind of changing them to make something new. Um, Do I read to keep everything? Keep all of my files, yeah, every single file. Never delete anything. And then you go because you can go. You've got you can go back to it. You can go back to stuff. And you know, if you did have writer's block, you'd have, you know, four hundred files that you could kind of open and go, oh, wow, I don't remember this one. You know, the bass line's <laughs> great, or the drums are great in that. And actually, I had that fairly recently and and got a great track from it. So I think you know, keeping files, sampling stuff, just pushing in a little bit of a different direction, maybe, you know, try, if you're writing techno all the time, try writing in another style. We talked about aliases earlier. You obviously have released under your own name recently as well, which is a lot different. Yeah. Do you, is that something you've done for a while? Like obviously how comes, obviously you, you haven't released under your own name for a, 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 a while. Why did you kind of choose to, now to release that track or? Um, I think, you know, obviously collaborating with Ridney, the sort of stuff that he does is completely different to what I was doing. I know that I was talking about kind of doing everything under the reset robot name, but I felt like that particular sound, I would probably lean it more towards my older stuff. So, and yeah, just an interesting thing to do at this time. And 
And I'm definitely going to do some more bits like that with him. So I think it was a good collaboration to do. I kind of had that loop to get loop up together and sent it over to him. And within about, you know, a couple of days, he'd kind of sent it off to this vocalist guy who'd done a bit of vocals and we sent it back and then, yeah, nice. it was kind of, kind of done. So, yeah, I don't, I think it just felt like the right time to do it. Should we listen to it? Gang, do you want to listen to it? Let's give it a listen. Well, if, yeah, yeah, by all means. Let's do it. They're completely different. Completely different. Probably a bit more commercial. and um, But yeah, you know, summer vibes. And Entel yeah, says you want to drink a mojito and eat some gogs to this. What the hell's a gog? What a gog? What is a gog? What is a gog? I wanna, what, uh, tell me, somebody in the chat, what is a gog? I really want to know what that is. Um, but yeah, someone says Paul, Paul, Paul in Ibiza vibes. Definitely. There you go. There you go. That's probably what was intended. Yeah. Yeah. So you, yeah. So that was under your own name. So do you have you you separate stuff up by aliases on on genre or? And, um. Do you think well, it's important? I, I kind of was. You know, we were kind of onto that earlier, and I don't. I don't think you know you should necessarily have to. And, mm-hmm. and actually, I've decided with my Reset Robot alias that I'm going to be a lot more varied with what I'm going to release just because that's what I'm producing at the moment. And I don't want to, just because I'm writing a slightly different style, think, oh, God, I need to have a different name for that. Mm-hmm. But I understand, I think, you know, I understand if you were really touring heavily and you had like a particular sound that people were going to see and you were kind of, releasing here here there and everywhere and all kinds of different styles why that might be sort of slightly confusing but for me at the moment i fit i'm feeling like i'm really just concentrating on the music and um being a bit more free with what i'm doing so yeah i'm just gonna stick i'll probably do a few more of these projects with ridney these collaborations but with regards to everything else it's just going to be under reset robot obviously a lot of our newer producers in the chat do you think like obviously they're kind of they haven't got the fan base i guess and kind of length of time in the industry that you've got do you think if they were if they were going to do that kind of swerving around genres a little bit they would Hmm. i think it depends what your end goal is you know obviously most of the time at the moment people are kind of producing with a view to sort of touring as a DJ that it, I don't know. That's probably my view of it. I might be wrong. And if there's anyone out there that's not, then please correct me. But that's the, that's the kind of what, way I sort of see, see it at the moment. So if that's the end goal, then, you know, I'm not sure that the way I'm doing it would work, but if you're just, you know, producing and then, then yeah, why not? Have you, you mentioned earlier, you're kind of cut, coming down on the touring what's is that for any reason or is it just happy as you are I, I kind of I think it was before it was before the COVID stuff happened and actually the the leading up to that sort of Christmas where it was all starting to happen I'd already sort of said right I'm gonna stop I'm gonna really slow down on the touring now mm-hmm. and um had kind of told a few key people that <clears throat> I didn't really want to take any bookings and I just wanted to concentrate on the studio work because I do a lot of engineering as well so and you know being at home I was kind of enjoying being at home more than I was going away so it made sense but yeah I'd kind of already 
made the decision and then the COVID thing happened and that kind of, for me, was just like, well, that's that then. I'm just <laughs> going to do that. But obviously, like now, now kind of looking, if I sort of see any clips of me DJing or if I see any of my mates DJing, I kind of think, yeah, I do miss it. I definitely do miss it, but I don't know if I want to do it again. Is it complete stop then? Have you? It's not a complete stop. I've got a couple of gigs in the diary, like I'm doing this drum code festival in Malta, which I know is going to be amazing. Like nice. if I could just pick, though, you know, it's those kind of gigs you want to do. You know, if I would, if I could play for Adam or do any of the We Are the Brave shows, I'd do them at the drop of a hat because you know the production is going to be amazing. You're going to get looked after. The venue is going to be great. The setup's going to be fine. There's going to be no issues or anything. It's all the kind of um, ones that people don't see where, you know, for someone when, I'm, when I was touring at my level, turning up to clubs that just aren't prepared for what you're going to do or, you know, the setup's terrible or, you know, just, just stuff like that where you kind of think, what am I doing here? Yeah, because you, you were a, you playing were you playing live as well? Was that, did I, is that I was I've read? done a lot of live stuff over the years, and I actually just before I decided to kind of slow it all down, I I'd kind of spent ages getting this live set ready, and mm-hmm. um, I had a fantastic show at Fabric, which was awesome, and then I did a couple of smaller ones, and then I ended up getting this one in um, Switzerland and. Yeah, it wasn't great, and I just thought I'd, I'd <laughs> oh, taken all, the, all this, <laughs> taken all this stuff, and spent all this time getting it ready. And I just thought this is probably what most of them are going to be like. Is this what I want to do, or do I want to sit in the studio in the comfort of my own home <laughs> and you know be able to kind of go out with my mates at the weekend and see my family and stuff like that? So I yep. kind of just thought, right, stop for a while and then you know see what see how i feel basically and at the moment i'm i'm quite happy with how things are well so, so two things the Dramco festival for those asking the chat is in malta and it's i've just i've just googled it uh it's the hang on, I'm going to get the dates for you it's, it's the epic 15th, lineup, september 15th, 15th to 19th of september uh mm-hmm. it's not that expensive like the stand is 259 euros is that including the hotel room that's from 259 euros. And you can secure a spot for 30 euro. It looks quite good. The lineup Adam Bayer, Alan Fitzpatrick, Anna Fisa, let go, Anna, Bart Skills, Ben Klopp, Carl Escobus, Chris Leaving, Christian Smith. Whoa, it's mad. Dyson Pika, Ilario Lacanti. Wow, Joseph Capriati, Jonas Vaughan, Juliet <laughs> Fox. Woo. It's, it's a big lineup. Letting, isn't it? letting God on. Yep. It's literally everybody. You know that the production on it's going to be awesome. Because Malta's a lovely it. place as well. I've been to Malta a few times. It's it's absolutely lovely. Also, everything's the been. same as the UK. Everything's the same as the UK in Malta as well. UK plugs yes. drives on the right drives on the same side of the road. Win win. <laughs> and you mentioned your engineering. How did if people want to work? Do you, do you, do people can people work with you? How does that work? People can work with me, yeah. I'm actually without a studio at the moment, but that's sort of being amended. I'm having a new space built. So, yeah, looking forward to getting in there, and it's nearly ready, actually. So um, just got to get all the acoustic stuff sorted, and then I'll be getting my stuff back in there and getting going again. So, yeah, I've worked with a lot of people, and, um, you know, can, can kind of, if people want to bring stems and you know work on arrangement that can be done or write stuff from scratch just depends what people want to do really a lot of time i think when you're sort of when you're when you're in music you're you you sort of your music is your hobby and it always was your hobby to start with and then you kind of get into it seriously it becomes your job and then and then you kind of need your other hobbies to get out of it and kind of keep some headspace what are your what are your downtime what are your hobbies what are your other stuff you into yeah, I'm, I def- I like really love sports. So I play a lot of sport, uh, golf, and um, tennis. So I play a lot of tennis and a bit of football as well. And I love cooking. So cooking, nice. bake. Yeah, yeah, baking as well. I bake a lot of bread and make nice. pizza and stuff like that. So you know, having 
those things as hobbies, I think, is really important. And tennis for me actually has been has been a fantastic one to get into. And I really do love it. Finding one that you actually love is great. That must be good for that must be sorry yeah that must be good for a producer because obviously you're opening your shoulders and you're because you're I, th- I figure like when myself when I'm sat at a computer like this all the time I'm just thinking like you're kind of opening out your shoulder and it's gonna that's gonna release all this here basically it definitely does and like you know really getting out there and having a good hit with somebody that's can hit a ball is a good bit of exercise like you come off court absolutely dripping with sweat if you're you're playing (laughs) singles that is yeah 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 mini question for reset robot how deep does the rabbit hole go for mr Wu? ah we haven't done anything together for ages so mr Wu is a collaboration that i um a project i was working on with john gerd and oh nice guy called tom pal and this was quite a few years ago we released some quite unusual records quite a few years ago but quite experimental stuff but we had a blast like absolute ball writing that stuff it was so much fun probably some of the most fun i've had in the studio ever actually um we all kind of used to take a couple well there was a couple of times where we took a few weeks off in a chunk and then just every day we'd be you know with a view to writing an album actually and that actual process of taking time off and all three of us getting in the studio and writing together was so good. So, yeah, but we haven't done anything together for ages. Obviously, John's doing really well at the moment with his stuff on Anjuna Deep, and he's out touring again. So congratulations to him. We're still, we're still in touch, actually, and speak quite a lot. So, But, yeah, we're, we're all still friends, but we just haven't done anything together. Another question. Do you visualise... Do you vis- use VU meters for gain staging? No. <laughs> Simple. Love it. No. <laughs> okay. Um, I don't even know what a VU meter is, so there you go. Cool. I'm just being um, you honest. You, no, good. You mentioned you did uh, your remix for Poker Flat, and that's kind of how that's this started. Have you got any tips on remixing? Because MXL has just started a remix and he hasn't got a clue where to go. Okay. Yeah, remixing can be really hard sometimes. When I take a remix on, I'm sort of normally, when I'm listening to the original track, you know, people say like, oh, do you want to remix this song? I kind of normally zone in on a couple of sounds that I think might be really useful. And then when I get the stems, you never know what's going to work, but... What I normally do is I'll just cut a big chunk out of the track. So like a two bar or four bar loop out of the original track, kind of move it all to, you know, the beginning of the arrangement. And then I'll just start trying to add stuff over the top of that. Just so you're sort of, because sometimes when you're looking at these really long stems and you've got bits happening over here, but it can get a bit confusing and you kind of don't know where to go. So yeah, condense it down, take a chunk, put it to the start, start adding some, you know, your kind of drums over the top or take their drums out and start writing some musical stuff over their bits. And often, you know, you might end up taking a lot of things out, but it's a good way for me. It's a good way of kind of getting rid of that noise, the sort of visual noise of looking at someone else's stems. That's cool. Should we play another track? Yeah, go for it. Right. Uh, I was just going to scroll back. Uh, four months ago, you had a release on your own. You teamed up with... Seuss, yeah. For an EP, for a two-tracker. This was on your own yeah. label. So how is that working with somebody else? Did you do that in the studio? Is it a remote thing? Yeah, no, he's he sort of lives locally. So I took um, a couple of bits of kit around to his place and we just recorded for a couple of hours. He had some, just a, basically a kick drum going and we hooked up the matriarch again and just recorded a load of stuff and he had the... I think the D fam and the mother 32 from Moog as well. So he had those going and a bunch of other stuff. So yeah, we just jammed basically and nice. cut lots and lots of audio after that. Well, he kindly cut up lots of audio and then, you know, um, we kind of organized it. And then I t- he did, um, he ended up finishing the track that's called Riser. And then I did the one that's called Pendant. This is independent then. Let's go for it.
holy moly. Yeah, I think you can sort of hear, <laughs> especially in that breakdown there, that, you know, we were just kind of like jamming with sounds and that arc that kind of goes all crazy. And, you know, you probably wouldn't necessarily get to that if you were just drawing in automation on a soft synth. That must so. be really fun. I think I feel like if I was going to make wanted to, do, I feel like if I was going to do it, that's how I'd want to do it. Like literally play and twist knobs and just get hands on. Yeah, I think it's the most enjoyable. It's the it most it. enjoyable. It it, it. You know, it doesn't necessarily always. You know, you wouldn't always be able to say, "Oh, that's a hardware synth or that's a software synth," because obviously you can send out to controllers and control soft synths the same way. But I think. You know, there is something to be said about, you know, having a jam like that and just kind of letting loose a little bit. Intel said, bro, this sounds so popular in the drum code scene. The intricacies in the noise that protrudes off the bass is everything and so hard to nail. Hang on. Yeah, those little noise um, hits and splashes, that's the, that's the um, I think, the drummer from Another Mother, the DFAM thing from Moog as well, which is just, it's wicked. Uh, what was that question I read a minute ago, which is quite funny? Surround Sound. Has he been to the Kingfisher chip shop in the Albert Road and why is the best chippy in the world? How do you even <laughs> know that Surround Sound? The, the, the Kingfisher <laughs> fish and chip shop definitely isn't the best fish and chip shop in the world. But, <laughs> you know, I have been there. I have been there. <laughs> That's going deep, dude. How did you even, like? <laughs> well, they someone uh, maybe they live locally. I don't know. No, he lives in he lives in like West Coast America. Oh right, okay. Wow, he's googled him. <laughs> <laughs> or he knows Portsmouth. He is yeah. from Ireland, so he's originally from Ireland. So he, he'll know he might know this area. But oh, that's going deep, dude. Well that's done. That's great. <laughs> and then Intel asks, oh, here we go. Can you ask me if he's a sourdough soldier or a tiger bread bandito? I'm wow. A, I'm a sourdough soldier. I think we should have that as a poll, Loz. Let's do that. Sourdough all the way for me. Let's. Can we have that as a poll, Loz? Will, Will Clark's like really into his baking as well. So <clears throat> we always, um, you know, Sunday morning we'll be kind of, or Monday or whatever, sending pictures of, the bake nice. that we've just done yeah kind of going look at this nailed it or disaster or whatever you know uh there you go check gang in the chat you can choose whether you're a sourdough soldier or a you can have your own vote <laughs> tiger Get bread what was it tiger bread bandito or a, sour a sourdough soldier i love right, that okay. and if you want to upvote you can use your channel points to upvote it go for it let's see who's going to win get voting in the chat <laughs> i love it what tips would you give for cutting through the noise of the industry? Whoa, there's a big one. Um, that's tough, man. It's really tough. It, it's yeah, it's um, easy to feel kind of bogged down, I think, and probably quite sort of. I don't know. I can't imagine sort of starting out now. So I have no idea how I'd kind of navigate the scene if I was just getting going. It's a really interesting question. I think for me, I've always just tried to, you know, write music that I like to write and kind of make a happy space in the studio and, and kind of find my sound and stuff like that. You know, I think being happy there gives you the most chance of sort of moving on with it. But yeah, like sending music out and stuff now is completely different and getting heard now is completely different. So I think you just have to be sort of content with what you're doing and, you know, make some good connections out there and try and get out and meet people still. I think sort of knowing people now is still key. So. Agreed. Went to a conference on, on last Thursday. It was amazing to go and meet a load of people again. It was yeah, I still think it's the way that things get done. You know, people going to conferences, going to club nights, trying to meet people. You know, if you're a producer, getting your music to DJs that are playing at certain events that you like and stuff like that. I think that's so important rather than, I don't know, yeah, it's good to sort of um, keep that. It's, it's, still the, it's still one of the best ways just getting out there. 
Like what, what conference was it you went to? I went to a Torum one. So I was speaking at a Torum one. Torum had their own. It was for their Torum Academy. And yeah. uh, I was speaking on social about social media. It was really good. I really enjoyed it. And but it was good to meet so many people that were a part of the Torum Academy. So many like some of the I met some of the because there was different people speaking, obviously someone from Anjuna, someone from some of the other labels. So that was good. So I kind of made some new connections, which was which I didn't have before. So even that like little bits of yeah, it was good. Exactly. So yeah, that's kind of speaks for I think you know, you I think it depends on the sort of person as well. Like that guy at the moment that runs around Malt's shopping centres with the decks on his Sua. Sua, yeah, like obviously like obviously that's going to be popular and a lot of people are going to want to see that. And, you know, now he's doing his own nights and stuff like that. So, but not everyone's going to be able to do that or think of doing that. <clears throat> so he's absolutely nailed it by doing something with, you know, that's going to explode on social media. Mm. But, you know, if you're a producer sat in a studio, kind of just beavering away, writing tunes, I think that's, much more difficult now to kind of get cut through that noise. He's just he's just made an audience for it. Like he's he's he came up with that idea in in lockdown, and I think he was he was already doing it a little bit, but then he just hammered it in lockdown and kind of nailed yeah. it in lockdown when he, when he, yeah. when people couldn't go out. He was like, I'm going to go out for my hours walk. I'm going to DJ while I'm walking, and I'm going to. And he just he's just he's just made it. He just made basically just built an audience first and foremost. Exactly, and that audience he's now going to come see him play. Exactly, exactly. And he was at, he was at Gun Wharf recently in Portsmouth. Um, nice. So that that was good to see. Yeah, I've seen, I've seen him. I've seen so many. I've seen so many when he gets thrown out of things as well, like thrown out of places, which is quite funny as well. Which obviously just makes even when he gets, he's being thrown he gets out, he's, out he's everywhere, just, and he's just being like running away from the security guards and stuff. It's, but it still funny. makes a piece of content for him, and it's just like another thing that you can share. And people laugh at it because he's been thrown out, and he's just like, no, yeah, just blow the place from records. Yeah, I mean, I don't know. I'm not great with social media, to be honest. So I think I probably feel lucky that I'm kind of got my foot in the door when I <laughs> when I did because of my sort of personality and the way that, you know, I just, I'm not kind of this person that's going to be taking videos all the time. It's not my first instinct to kind of like film something or, take a picture of something that's never my sort of first mm. thought so obviously that i'm terrible when i did have people doing my social media they're like dave you have to take some pictures do a video of you in the studio i'm like oh yeah yeah i'll definitely do that and then just never ever do it but <clears throat> that's just me how's our vote going the tiger print is winning 63 percent to 38 percent no I think sourdough, obviously, it depends. Like, for me, like, tiger bread, obviously, for a sandwich. Like, a sourdough sandwich is quite a, a difficult one to kind of chew on. You get yeah. the sourdough, the chewiness, the crusts are quite tough to bite down on. Tiger bread's obviously a lot softer. Sourdough for, like, toast or a grilled cheese definitely blows tiger bread out of the water but i think yeah if you're just wanting like a cheese salad sandwich the type then tiger bread would deliver a much better sandwich it's pretty close it's 60 40 now it's getting there. okay we'll see how long it's how long it's got left laws we really we're really talking about cut bread with one okay and take no producers we really are we really are <laughs> this is what happens in our streams. We go random. We can. We can. We've got plenty of time. Well, uh, everyone we eats bread, don't they? Yeah, we can talk about tech now, and then we'll talk about we'll talk about grilled cheese. We've got this is the joy of a long. This is what we can do. This, this is, is what this conversation. You can't talk about just production and and techno all the time, can you? This is this is the joy of having a longer interview. We can we can we can go there. We can. We've got time to go there. Uh, Diego James, can you ask about how he broke into the festival circuit? Did he work with agents and managers or did he just start booking it himself at the start? Um, the fest I mean, I've never really done that many festivals. Obviously, I have done some. Um, but yeah, breaking into the sort of club scene, I have worked with agents and I have worked with managers over the years. I don't think I was 
ever fully happy with sort of anyone that I worked with in that capacity. And I don't mean that in a nasty way. I just mean I don't think it ever quite worked for me because I think if you have a manager or if you have an agent, you know, you have to really know where you want to play, where you want to go, what you want to do in your sort of touring career. You know, you have people, I know people that have done it well and they are so driven. They know all the clubs, they know what festivals they want to do and they are on the case with, you know, to their agent or their manager. You know, I want to do this, this and this, phoning them all the time emailing them all the time you have to be really kind of on people's case with that sort of thing to get them actually kind of working for you and I think um yeah for me I I worked with a couple of good ones but yeah it was it was always very difficult I think you only really need like a manager if you're or a booking agent if you're super busy it depends if you've got if you've got someone that's going to be really proactive and work for you and get out there and get you gigs and that's amazing but they're few and far between most people will just wait for stuff to come in i think yeah Um, i've always thought that i always thought if you if you're especially one of the bigger agencies when it's just your name and amongst other people then you've still got to work it yourself and you've still got to bring bring the noise that 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 drives people in yeah exactly people think that it's like i can't just get on that agency or with that management then i'd be playing all these places that does not happen. You you have to kind of bring it, you know. And if you're not in, in demand, then you're not in demand. Yeah, and you're still not going to get the bookings anyway. Yeah, so it can be. It's it's a it's a tough one. I, I don't think it's necessary for someone starting out. I think doing it yourself, you're probably going to end up. You know, if you are kind of like you know doing it yourself, and you were to email. Um, booking agents yourself as in club booking agents the person who's doing the bookings at a certain club and you kind of try and build a relationship like that you're gonna probably be doing more work than anyone else would be doing for you anyway agreed unless yeah and the other option is getting one of those smaller smaller agencies but smaller like agencies yeah and it, those yeah so hard yeah and finding the right person you know as well that's that's really tough let's listen to the other, the other part of that ep Let's play, let's play Riser. There we go. Wow. That sounds amazing. I, I'm so impressed with what Tim did with uh, that. He really did do an amazing job and the mix down sounds phenomenal. And the way that, you know, it's super trippy and kind of sounds like loads of random sounds, but as it goes on, it really does become this kind of like really meaningful track. Everything kind of comes together. Uh, Testy Macaroon has got a bit of a hangover and he said, this tune is how I feel right now, proper out there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, it's, it's trippy. And, um, you know, I'd love to hear that in uh, sort of, I'd love to kind of go to somewhere where you could be sort of free enough to play something like that. There's not many places that you could. You know, you know that's yeah, like like one of those clubs where it opens at six a.m. and then goes on till yeah. lunchtime. At about yeah. about ten a.m., play it then. Yeah, and exactly. Then you see, see all the kind of wrongness happening to it. I guess. Yeah. People with their sunglasses on that probably shouldn't just have sunglasses. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> just just they're hanging on to life a little bit and just yeah, no, definitely. I think you know it's. 
it's got a certain vibe and uh yeah it, he is a great producer really good producer who else are you feeling right now from a production point of view who else is on your radar who uh, what who else is music you're liking i really i, I love seb okay stuff at the moment yep. I'm, I'm i really really love his bits and Fortet as well, I think it's amazing. Over Mono, I've been listening to loads. I think leaning more towards that electronica kind of vibe recently, I think. Mm -hmm. And um, especially with what I'm listening to at home or in the car and stuff like that. Yeah, loving that sort of stuff. I guess now you're kind of not in the clubs. It's more kind of that home listening and more kind of that's affecting your kind of production and where you're going musically. A little bit, yeah. I mean, I think this... So the album that I released on Whistleblower, the part one is kind of a bit more clubby. And then part two that's coming in um, June is just basically all electronica sort of stuff. What's the plans for the rest of the year? You got So your album coming out in June, second album? album come, second album coming out in June. It's kind of like um, I wanted to do it as a two-part thing because the, all the tracks were kind of being done at a similar time and I thought it'd be interesting to have that sort of more kind of clubby vibe and then the sort of after hours or electronica sort of stuff as the second part but yeah I mean with regards to what's come up I've still got a bunch of unreleased tracks of course Um, I'm kind of waiting on this new studio project to be finished so I'm looking forward to getting in there and just you get so used to a, a space and how a space sounds I think it I remember how exciting it was going into my last, when I changed studios last time. So I'm really, and this is like, I'm really going for it on the acoustic side of things here. And um, I think it's going to sound amazing. So, you know, this kind of thing can change your sound a little bit, or you suddenly hear frequencies you've not heard before in your track. So I'm, I'm, I'm looking forward to seeing what that brings. But with regards to releases, yeah, just uh, this poker flat thing. And um, I've got a remix for the Mia Mendy guys as well, which is on pre-order at the moment. And that's coming out after the poker flat release. And that's also a little bit deeper. It's a vocal track. <clears throat> so yeah, I've got that. And then part two of this album. And then, yeah, I'll just be writing a bunch of new stuff, I think. They uploaded that. Should we see if, we can see if it's on pre-order? I was look. They they must have calmed down because they were proper tough as well. Their their stuff's gone a little bit more, yeah, kind of uh, melodic now, I suppose. Here we go. I found it. Porcelain okay. song. Um, we'll just give us a little play. See what happens. go that's lovely yeah so i think you know it's um clear that i'm definitely (laughs) my sound's definitely changing a little bit but it doesn't necessarily mean that that's what i'm going to be doing from here on in you know must be nice to have that freedom it does feel good yeah but these guys specifically you know they came to me and said look we really like your track denial that was on my album on uh, We Are The Brave. That was in 2019. 
and they kind of said, oh, would you do something like that for us? So, of course, yeah, I was more than happy to. But I actually tried to do a brakes thing for them. <clears throat> but I sent them one and they were like, yeah, it's cool. But you kind of know from people's reactions how they really feel about things sometimes. And it yeah. was, um, I sort of said to them, look, listen to this. I am working on a different version as well. And then I did this one, sent it over, and I was like, this is this is the one. We've got to use this. And they agreed. So Nice. That's cool. Yeah. Yeah. Wicked. Wicked. Dave, thank you so much for joining us. This has been so no much worries, fun. No worries, man. This has been really good fun. Yeah, thanks for having me. It's really nice to chat and talk about all this stuff, bread, techno, <laughs> plugins. Love it. Whatever, whatever, whatever comes along. If you found this interview interesting, consider giving it a like and a comment. It helps me with the YouTube algorithm and let me know your biggest takeaway below. Don't forget to follow me on Twitch. I'm back on Mondays, Wednesdays, and Fridays, and you can check out the schedule from the link below as well to see who's coming up in my interview series. I'll see you in the next Twitch stream or the next YouTube video. I'll see you soon. Bye.